Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Darcy Marie. Um, it's video time, so I have a diagnosis of episodic ataxia. And I'm making this video to hope in hopes to bring a raise awareness on this very rare condition. Um, anyways, I hope you find it insightful. Um, so based on my family history, um, we have a, we have a, well, I'm suspected to have episodic ataxia type two. Um, Based on my family history, because it's genetic, um, I've had other family members with the same condition. Um, they have been gen genetically tested um, and were positive for uh, cerebellar ataxia. And based on the family history and the symptoms and everything, matches down to episodic ataxia type 2 according to my neurologist. So um, there is uh, variations and differences between episodic symptoms in ataxia and uh, um, permanent and pro slowly progressive symptoms. And I want to kind of kind of get into this detail based on my experience with it. Um, permanent and progressive symptoms are slowly progression of, let's say, you're, you have a degenerative condition called ataxia. Um, it's slowly progressing over a number of years. Some cases does not shorten life expen expectancy. Some cases are said to shorten life expectancy. Um, due to having like complications uh, from the progression of the disease. Um, and this can be in a sense life-threatening, um, but I wanted, um, that's what a slowly progression is. I wanted to give you a general idea. So a slowly progression in ataxia is like, um, when it first starts, you may look like you have mild symptoms, but as the years go on, you may notice a change, um, a worsening of your symptoms. So that's what that is. Episodic symptoms and ataxia. Okay, I wanted to break this down to you. Um, episodic symptoms are ataxia symptoms. Um, that are episodic in nature. So this means the symptoms come on and then go. Okay, so with the episodic nature of ataxia, a lot of people just think, well, your symptoms come on and go. But people don't realize um, how aggressive some of this can be. Um, the suddenness, the unpredictability of it, um, the sudden symptoms that like you're it's a lot like you're being attacked with all these symptoms all at one time and it just feels like you are being this is why people um describe it as attacks of ataxia with episodic ataxia because it feels like you're being attacked by all these symptoms basically it comes on with extra force. It's It can be extremely unpredictable rather than slowly progressing with time. So a lot of people, and I'm not saying this um, is not with other types of progressive ataxias, but a lot of people with episodic ataxia end up with a lot of anxiety because 
their symptoms come on so suddenly and it's so unpredictable. Not to mention the dangers behind having uh, being attacked by symptoms. Um, it can be very scary and it brings out a lot of anx anxiousness and anxiety. Um, like with people with permanent and progressive symptoms, um, as it gets to its worst point, they develop complications, but the unpredictability and episodic ataxia can indeed very well be, in a sense, dangerous, um, possibly even life-threatening, depending on the circumstances and uh, where you're at, what you're doing at the time. For instance, if you're driving, it's not good to have an episode. <laughs> so, I mean, that can indeed be life-threatening and dangerous. So it's, you got to kind of listen to your body when it comes to episodic attacks. If you don't feel right about doing something, then don't do it. If you're feeling you're having an off day, then don't, don't do this. Um, so anyways, now that I explained that, episodic ataxia type 2 comes from uh, the gene CACN. 1A or something like that, um, which is, uh, it can be like mutations within the gene. So with episodic ataxia type 2, um, another, a different mutation within that same gene is responsible for spinocerebellar ataxia type 6. And based on my understanding, and also hem hemolytic migraine or something like that, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but I think you get the point. So within a different mutation within the same gene, like I said, um, research suggests that with episodic ataxia type two and these migraine headaches, um, and spinocerebellar ataxia type six, even though they come, they're, they're supposed to be different disorders, but they come from the same gene um, and different mutations within that gene. It suggests that they overlap in features, clinical features or symptoms. Um, so they can appear very much similar to each other. Um, but they're different disorders at the same time based on my understanding of it. And so, which explains why a lot of people with episodic ataxia type two end up having migraine headaches along with their episodes because of that overlapping of the migraine and the EA2. And the same with spinocerebellar ataxia type six. Some people with SCA6 has episodes of unsteadiness and vertigo and based on my understanding can be treated with exozolamide as well but um ea2 episodic ataxia type 2 is also treated with this um so again there's that overlapping in the symptoms between these three diseases um so People with episodic ataxia type 2 can, um, some of them can develop a slowly progression of symptoms in between their episodes as well, which makes it seem like they do not, um, they don't just have episodes of ataxia, but in between they have this slowly progression of let's say balance issues or impaired uh, tandem gait, which is the heel to toe. Um, you go in to see the neurologist, you have episodic ataxia type 2, and the neurologist does an exam on you, and they can see these impairments in a person with episodic ataxia type 2. I've been there, and I've done that as well. So, um, I wanted to explain that further based on my research and understanding and, you know, what I understand about it. Um, there is also, um, let's say, 
people with episodic ataxia type 2 um, can develop cerebellar atrophy, which can be seen on an MRI, which is evidence of your cerebellum shrinking or deteriorating over time, which can lead to the progression of these symptoms. So I personally have that as well as the, as well as the rest of my other family members have cerebellar atrophy with an episodic ataxia type 2 diagnosis. So, um, I also wanted to display some photos of my MRI in this video as well. Um, I wanted to show and what a normal MRI looks like and what a cerebellar atrophy my MRI looks like. So you will see that there's a difference there as I show them in this video. This is what a normal MRI looks like in a person without cerebellar atrophy. The cerebellum is the area in the very back of the brain. It's like rounded, kind of like this, um, in the very back of the brain. Uh, near the brain stem. This is what my MRI looks like, um, which shows a deteriorating cerebellum in the back of the brain. Now, as you can see um, from the photos, there are areas within my MRI. It appears like it's a little bit smaller in size. There are all these darker areas um, surrounding it that shouldn't be, um, which indicates, you know, my cerebellum is smaller than it should be. There is also like on top, like a crack um, that looks like a crack within my cerebellum, which indicates, you know, it had shrunk a little bit in that area. It looks like there's a dark branch coming through my cerebellum. It's really weird, but my neurologist says that shouldn't even be there. Now, this is just an example of a random MRI that shows cerebellar atrophy. Now, as you can see with my MRI, um, similar to that one, there were like dark branches within the cerebellum going in, um, very much like mine, where the blue arrows are pointing. General symptoms of degenerative ataxia, um, often genetic, <sighs> um, in coordination, um, Impairment of gait, balance issues, dysarthria, which is slurred speech, um, loss of muscle control, which can occur in the legs, but not only the legs, but everywhere else in the body, um, the arms and the mouth, which can lead to slurred speech. Um, feeling weak. Um, weakness in your extremities. Um, some people may experience vertigo, severe dizziness, nausea, and vomiting. Most people have a eye movement abnormalities or eye conditions. Um, some of it called nystagmus, crossing eyes. Um, Others are visual problems like blurred or double vision associated with these eye problems. Difficulty walking. 
a lot of cases you may re eventually rely on a wheelchair or a walker for mobility. A number of people with ataxia have falls or injuries. These are general symptoms of ataxia.